Smashamaniacs. Gearheads. It's time for another Geo Gearheads episode. Welcome to the very sequential episode. One, two, three. 123, most people are going to say, but hey, I like numbers. You know, that's an easy number to remember. We had an easy question for the prize. In fact, the answer to the question was in the episode number 123. I'm just saying. But on a subject that might not be very easy. I'm the Bad Cop with Daryl W4 and Jennifer of Team AJK, and we'll be talking today about puzzles. That's like, right, and let's jump right in and welcome uh, Team AJK, or, well, at least the member J for Jennifer of Ithaca, New York. She writes the uh, Geocaching Puzzle of the Day blog, which features geocaching puzzles from all over the world every day, and has since January 1st of 2011. Welcome, Jennifer, and thanks for being our puzzle expert tonight. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, last week we asked our audience the very simple question of what type of encryption is used for the hints on geocaching.com. We had a record number of correct entries this week, and I'm sure all 22 of those geo gearheads are anxious to hear who won. Jennifer, would you care to tell us uh, who was drawn as a winner for the uh, Cash Advanced gift certificate? Happy to. That lucky winner is Limax. Well, congrats. And I think Limax has won recently. We, we've got this you know, group shipping going off to him. Anyway, you should have already received that gift certificate in your email. And thanks again to Cash Dash Advance for donating that gift certificate. Now, Jennifer, you know what the answer is. You better know what the answer is. <laughs> <laughs> or we may have the wrong guess for the show. <laughs> uh, but the answer is ROT13. And see the one and the three right on either side of the one, two, three? See, yeah, I'm going for that, right? But uh, I understand there's a little more to it than just ROT13. Well, there's certainly nothing wrong with, with thinking about just ROT13, but there's actually a whole slew of, of ROTs. You could do up to 25 of them. Um, what you're doing when you ROT is rotating by whatever number of places that is. If you think about it like a cipher wheel, you'd be rotating or shifting that number of places in the alphabet. Uh, it's also called a Caesar cipher. It goes back to Julius Caesar, who happened to like a ROT3 himself. So uh, ROT13 is a real easy one for people to use because you don't have to worry about whether you're going to the left or to the right. 13 takes you to the same place either way and uh, it was used in the beginning of uh, Usenet news groups to sort of mask or uh, hide spoiler type things and it was adopted for the same type of reason on geocaching.com. Interesting. So the the rotation or, or ROT where we get the, the uh, rotation from basically is like your little orphan Andy decoder ring. You're you going to set it. that to, you know, certain thing and then and then with that you'll be able to decode that you need to drink more Ovaltine. So uh, but uh, you know I was thinking ROT13 is just one type of Caesar cipher. It's one of the easier Caesar ciphers and just go ahead and try to say that ten times fast. I'm not going anymore. I have no problem with Caesar salad but Caesar ciphers are another thing entirely. With that said uh, you know we know one I know one type so it means I think I could get the other Caesar type ciphers you know, pretty easily. You know, now you got me thinking about uh, Caesar salads and our breakfast <laughs> meet up at the uh, Bike Stop Cafe just across the street from uh, Geo Woodstock 12. Now, they don't have a Caesar salad on the menu, <sighs> but uh, I was going through their uh, menu. We're going to be there for breakfast, so, you know, Caesar salad probably wouldn't be that uh, interesting anyway. You need fiber for breakfast. <laughs> but I was looking at the breakfast menu, and the thing that really jumped out at me is the uh, Juarez wrap. So hopefully uh, many of you, more of you will be uh, joining us at 8 a.m. Central on May 24th for that uh, breakfast or just, you know, a tasty beverage. We'll be hanging out for about an hour before the official Geo uh, Woodstock start, chatting, and we'll even have a box of swag to pass out. As long as you're at Geo Woodstock, though, even if you don't make it to the event, try to catch the uh, Bad Cop or I 
there and hit us up for one of the uh, special Geo Gearheads cards. And that's going to be your key to any of the bonus content we produce while we're on that trip, plus a chance at a couple of extra prize drawings here on the show. How cool is that? Now, Daryl, when you say tasty beverage, I don't remember where I heard it, but it always kicks in alcohol to me, and that doesn't work first thing in the morning. Um, unless you've had a rough night, and then you just keep going and, you know, you work it out, but that's well, not what we're know, talking about I here. hear in Germany, we have breakfast is a common breakfast, or uh, beer is yeah. a common breakfast uh, drink, so, you know, hey, maybe. There you go. Well, be that as it may, Daryl and I will not be having beer at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, but I don't think they serve beer. Only no. tasty coffee and tea drinks, I think. Well, there you go. And if you know me, I'm not a morning person. I'm going to need a lot of caffeine to get going. So uh, now Daryl and I only have a couple hundred of those cards that he just showed on screen. So if you're listening to the podcast, it's a business card. Come and see us. Um, the best place to find us is at that breakfast meetup. Now, we're also sending the information that's on the back side of that card that Daryl didn't show you to our patrons like Jersey Eric and Native Texan and in order to thank them for their support. You know, there's a dozen or so patrons and a few one-time donors like Minnesota Boy. They're the reasons we can keep bringing this show to you. So thank you again for that support. And thank you all for listening or even watching the Geo Gearheads, especially for sharing these shows with your friends. Now, I'm sure this is going to be one of those shows that people will be sharing as a great way to get into puzzles. So thanks again for joining us. And before we get into the meat of this episode, maybe a bacon, I don't know. Uh, give us a little background about yourself and about the blog, if you would, Jennifer. Sure. Uh, I started caching about four years ago, and I really quickly discovered that I enjoyed doing puzzle caches, but I had some trouble figuring out some of the ones around here and started to solve puzzles far and wide just to get practice for it. And, you know, I found I enjoyed it so much that I wanted to share some of those puzzles with other people. And uh, the blog sort of grew out of a personal challenge to myself to try to find and solve a year's worth of fun and interesting puzzles. And I kept going after the year. Now over 1,200 puzzles later, we're still going. Um, the blog doesn't provide any spoilers, so don't you know worry about that. But it just serves as a way to give creative puzzles a wider audience and encourage more people to practice doing puzzles or get inspired to put out their own puzzles. And I'd like to reach out to the viewers there and say that if anybody's created or solved any puzzles they think would be appreciated by a wider audience, I'd love it if you'd pass them along to me through geocaching.com. Yeah, it sounds like a great way to uh, get a little bit more adept at uh, uh, solving puzzles and certainly exposes you to a whole lot more than you're necessarily going to see just looking around your local area. Now, the unknown cache type is a pretty broad category, which is where puzzle caches uh, fall in the icons. And tonight we're going to focus on the solve at your desk type of puzzle cache where all the necessary work is done at home. So let's start off with kind of the obvious uh, first question is what's the attraction of solving all of this extra stuff to go find one smiley? Well, you know, it's kind of funny. People seem to either love puzzles or really not love puzzles, and uh, I'm one that does. I find the search for the solution almost as much fun as the search for the cache itself. You know, there's we call it this aha moment when you figure out what the puzzle's all about, and you know, the feeling is just like you get when you find a well hidden cache. You know, out there, looking under all the stumps and under the down logs, and just when you think you're there's no way you're going to find the darn thing. You give it one more try and you make that find. And I think we've all had that sort of rush and, you know, you're cheering and happiness out there in the woods. And <laughs> I can get that same feeling at home. It might be pouring down rain or snowing outside, but I can take myself puzzling, uh, you know, anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world. Uh, it doesn't cost me any gas money. Um, I have a lot of fun with it. Uh, I know that some people actually work on puzzle caches at work when they have some downtime, <laughs> and uh, it's just a fun way to sort of prepare yourself to get out there and, and do caching if you ever get the chance. I uh, really doubt I'm ever going to cache in all 50 states, but I've solved puzzles in all 50 states and probably 30-some countries, and uh, it's spurred some fun traveling for me to go and find some of those puzzles I have solved, and I've 
uh, encountered some really great uh, catch owners along the way, both uh, over the computer and in person uh, through my virtual puzzling travels. Nice. Now, I know my boss doesn't listen to this show, so I can say, <laughs> that, you know, yes, I've solved some puzzles at work. But, you know, I, I, no, 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 of course I haven't. I don't know what I was thinking. Well, those puzzles are our work-related puzzles. You know, actually, it gets your mind going. It helps you be more productive and more creative at work. So, and you'd mentioned, you know, that uh, it can be just as exciting as finding the cash. And, and that really is the case. I mean, I've worked hard to solve a puzzle, gone out and go, oh, yeah, it's just, you know, uh, a cash hidden over there. That's not the big deal. The big deal was the puzzle, puzzle for me. And uh, caches are always in the last place I look. Of course. Because once I find them, I stop looking. Um, now, the puzzles tend to be confusing, especially to those with little experience. So, you know, what can we do to get better at puzzle solving? Honestly, I think the main thing you can do, as with most other skills, to get better is just to practice. You know, you want to learn as much as you can about the, the types of them in the background and then just sort of practice, practice, practice. Uh, you know, when we started caching, we all had to develop some geosense, and uh, you've got to develop puzzle sense just the same way, and it can take some time. Yeah, that's true. You know, some cache pages I looked at with puzzles, some just jump right out to me, and others I've looked at a dozen times without seeing a place to start. Uh, we had a cache hider out here in our area that did a 14-stage puzzle cache. At each stage, there was a different type of puzzle. Some of them required you go home, you know, work on it, and come back. And, uh, you know, that is one of the greatest puzzle caches that, you know, when I think puzzle caches, that's what comes up to in, in my head first, so... Well, there's certainly there's all kinds out there. There's field puzzles and... and uh home puzzles and I tend to focus on the, the home puzzles certainly for the blog because that way anybody from anywhere can can solve them but in terms of finding the puzzle a lot of people have that uh, problem and I think you just need to sort of find the places to look you know think about where somebody could hide things um, and the idea that puzzle caches can be about anything you know people are just so creative and you know, I kind of thought when I started this, maybe I'd get to a point where I'd sort of seen everything and there, there wasn't going to be that much <laughs> new to see. But, you know, it, not a week goes by that I don't see something I've never seen before, I, that I have no idea how somebody ever figured out how to make it or create it. And um, it's just, it really gives me a charge. You know, I like seeing these clever puzzles, things I haven't encountered before. It's just like finding a really cool custom-made container or, you know, I think back to the first time I found an ammo can or the first time I found a nano cache and finding a new type of puzzle and seeing somebody, uh, the creativity that they've put into that uh, just gives me a real charge. You know, nice. there's so many, so many different kinds of puzzles. You could have a, a task to perform, some kind of a message or cipher to decrypt. You might have some sort of a conversion to complete, uh, instructions to draw out a set of coordinates. I even did a puzzle once where I crocheted uh, the answer. Uh, I probably could have done it on graph paper, but since I knew how to crochet, <laughs> I, I did that. <laughs> puzzle That's was archived cool. and it's in California, so I'm never going to find it, but you know, I had a good time doing it anyway. <laughs> um, you know, having a lot of tools available, uh, looking at the puzzle on the computer as opposed to on a tablet or a, a phone could be useful. Printing things out, you know, having lots of paper, pens, scissors, tape, um, all kinds of stuff like that could be could be useful to you. And uh, certainly your difficulty is going to vary a lot. You know, rating difficulty is tough. Uh, I test pe puzzles for people all the time and they'll ask me how hard I think it should be and, you know, I have a hard time even with that. So you, you sort of have to kind of take difficulty with, you know, a grain of salt there. Some people will include the uh, difficulty to hide as well. And uh, I recommend for people that haven't done a whole lot of puzzles to try to start with ones that are sort of moderate to medium difficulty. You know, don't go for those five-star ones first. It's going to take a while to work up to that. Uh, I, I tend to like to look for puzzles that have got a lot of favorite points on them, and people talk about them in the logs with a lot of praise that say it was fun or they enjoyed it. Uh, and I also recommend looking for puzzles that have checkers on them. You know, it, it gives you a place to uh, try to confirm, you know, that you have got it right before you actually go out there in the woods. I remember the first time I went caching with a friend of mine, she she couldn't believe we were going out somewhere just on my hunch that I had the thing right. So <laughs> uh, having a checker there is, is a, a nice thing to just sort of confirm things and say, yes, you know, I am going to the right place. And a lot of people will include hints and 
uh, things like that in their checkers as well about the location. So uh, I think when you look for cash owners that have created a lot of puzzles as well, that uh, allows you a chance to uh, pick up on a style that a, a person might have. And so if you want to solve a hard puzzle by a cash owner, I always recommend trying to go and solve some of their easy ones first. And that might give you a clue as to how they think and, you know, get into their style a little bit. Yeah, the the checkers are a big thing that I always look for in any puzzle or, you know, even some of the multi-caches in our area will start doing that if they have any kind of math or something to do, and that's really nice. But, you know, one thing that uh, really has you know, come up around here a lot lately is many of the puzzles really require you to get into the head of its creator. And that's turned off many of the caches because it's nearly impossible to solve one without really getting to know how that person builds their puzzles. I, I think that's true to an extent. You know, you do, you have to sort of figure out how they think. But, you know, the same could be said of hiding styles. Uh, when I go to a new area where I've never cached before, you know, I don't know whether this guy usually puts things in the pine tree or if they like magnetic things or they like nanos or whatever. So I think no matter what kind of, of caching you're doing, once you uh, sort of get a feel for the cash owner, things are going to come more easily to you. And, uh, you know, that said, just like traditional caches, some puzzle caches are going to be more enjoyable than others. And I would just encourage people not to let one sort of frustrating experience uh, turn you off of all puzzle caches because most cache owners uh, really do want their puzzles to be solved and the caches to be found. Uh, you know, there, there's a few out there that, that may be enjoy creating something nobody can solve, but I think those are really the minority. Most <laughs> of your puzzle cashers really do uh, appreciate the time that people put into working on them and want them to be enjoyed and, and solved and want the caches to be found. Yeah, I've actually run into a couple of uh, uh, cashers who have hid very challenging puzzles that they're very proud have taken years to solve or haven't been solved at all in many years. So there, there's a few out there, but you know, in in all, I'd say most of the uh, uh, cat or hiders, the puzzle hiders that I've talked with, are more than happy to try to help you out. Mm -hmm. But you have to show them that you've worked on it before they're going to start helping you out. So where do you start when you first see a puzzle? Well, like I was saying, I would recommend to look at everything on the cache page. You want to think about all the things that the cache owner could uh, change. If you've ever created your own geocache, you know, there's lots of different things you can put in there from things in the uh, uh, the date that it's hidden to things in the title, things in the uh, source code that can be hidden, you know, so lots of things can be hidden. And I think my favorite kinds of puzzles are ones that leave you what I'm going to call breadcrumbs. You know, there's some sort of a trail that you can follow. If you can just pick up on these little things, little nuggets of information that are left behind, then you can actually make your way to the solution. And sometimes you don't even see those breadcrumbs until you look back afterwards. And those are my favorites where you can see, man, this was all right there in front of me. I just had to, to find it, you know. Um, a lot of puzzles are going to have a theme that you need to discover. And so if you can just sort of figure out what it is that... Uh, they're talking about what this whole thing is about, then that'll give you some um, ideas of where you want to start working. And uh, I think one of the real important things to do is remember what your goal is. You know, usually with a puzzle, we're going to be looking for uh, numbers. We're looking for coordinates, which for most of us will be a, a set of 14, 15 out on the West Coast numbers. Uh, they might only give you 10. They might assume the degrees. Uh, sometimes they'll even assume the minutes, and you just need to find six numbers. But that's usually what the solution is going to be. Uh, there are some non-standard formats, like the uh, Universal Transverse Mercator, the UTM, that appears on all the cache pages. Sometimes you'll have to uh, get into that format or uh, some other format. And with the uh, certitude checker that's very popular on the West Coast, the solution could even be a keyword. So that's a whole sort of different kind of um, situation. So if you keep in mind what you're looking for, looking for uh, groupings of 14 or 15 things can be a great way to start. Um, uh, cash owners are pretty sneaky at uh, hiding things on the cache page, uh, in the source code, in images. Uh, if you can um, look at the image properties, that's a good trick. Sometimes people will hide things in there. Uh, sometimes just identifying the images themselves will give you some clues. And there's 
so many ways that we can do this. I, I tell you, I don't know what people did before Google, but uh, Google is my biggest puzzle tool. Uh, getting adept at doing different Google searches, um, searching images on Google, using Google Maps to uh, plot out things and you know figure out where the cache might be uh, is a huge, huge help. I certainly like it when the puzzle is, you know, the full um, latitude and longitude because then I can tell within the first couple of numbers, okay, I've got it right. I exactly. know, you know, 47 is going to be in there somewhere. I can start with that. And, you know, I shoot for that as the goal, then work from there. Right. So, it sort of gives you a toehold, you know, you can kind of exactly. reverse engineer. If, if I know this is true, then how can I figure out the rest of it? Exactly. So where... Where are we going to find the numbers in the puzzle? I mean, you know, oftentimes, you know, there, there's going to be numbers, but those aren't the ones we want. So I think if you keep in mind that there's a lot of different ways to count, you know, we think about one, two, three, four, five, but there's lots of other ways. I could say A, B, C, D, E, or uh, I could start with K. K would be the 11th letter of the alphabet, but a lot of folks drop that leading one and use K for a one and L for a two and M, N, O, and so on. Um, you could look for groupings of things like presidents, for example. You could count Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe. Uh, you could go with elements in the periodic table. Uh, you could go with states by order of their entry into the Union. You could do the uh, classic baseball positions. You know, anybody that's kept score in baseball, you've got your pitcher is one, catcher is two, first baseman's three, and, and so on. Uh, some of the more techie type uh, among us know the colors of the um, resistors. You've got uh, brown is one, red is two, orange is three, and so on. Uh, you could look at uh, things about gemstones, you know, birthstones related to different months. Garnet, amethyst, aquamarine, diamond, and emerald would go from one to five. Uh, thinking about another sort of uh, rock or gem related thing. You could think about the Mohs scale of hardness, you know, where talc is one, gypsum's two, and so on. Uh, looking at your typewriter keyboard, up above the one you've got the uh, exclamation point, above the two you've got the at, above the three you've got the pound, and so on. Uh, I could count like the uh, 12 days of Christmas, right? Partridge could be one, turtle doves could be two, French hens could be three, you know. <laughs> the list is really endless, you know, but uh, cash owners are, are good at disguising numbers in a lot of ways. Uh, they'll use the first letter of a name maybe for some sort of data you have looked up or the last digit of a year example, you know, if you look up somebody's birthday or the um, day they died or whatever, you know, uh, years and names are real good places to hide numbers. So it, those seem like some uh, easier themes, but I've seen some of like uh, the ciphers, which have just have, I've been beating my head up against the wall trying to figure out some of those. Mm -hmm. Ciphers can really be tough, you know, and uh, I think. There are certain uh, cipher puzzles that really are going to take a lot of practice just to even figure out what they're doing. Uh, there are a lot of real fancy online tools that are out there, but most of them are still going to require that you have some idea what the cipher is, you know, the general category of cipher. Um, there are lots and lots of sites that you can go to to read about different ciphers and practice uh, figuring out how they work, but even so, most of them usually tell you how to end cipher, you know, how to make your uh, thing into the cipher. They tell you less about how to do the deciphering process, and so that really does take some practice. There are some folks out there that like to write their own computer programs to do it. Uh, I'm not one of those, but I do try to take advantage of lots of the tools that are out there that can sort of, even if they can't solve it the whole way, they can maybe do some of the heavy lifting for you and, you know, help you. Uh, I would look for um, information from the ACA, the American Cryptogram Association, is a, a great source for uh, cipher information. And uh, a lot of times your uh, cash owner is going to give you some sort of those breadcrumbs I was talking about in the listing. They're going to help you figure out what the type of cipher might be. You know, the ciphers have some sort of unusual names. Um, I myself put out a cipher puzzle 
that I called Waltzing Matilda, and the type of cipher that it uses is called Swagman. And if you're familiar at all with the song Waltzing Matilda, it talks about a jolly Swagman. So that was my little clue as to which uh, cipher was going on. But if you've never heard of the Swagman cipher, you know that's not going to be too much help. So sort of learning about what types of ciphers are out there, what some of the names of them are, uh, can be useful. I think uh, on puzzles that aren't rated that difficult, if it's, you know, a two-star, two-and-a-half-star puzzle, something like that, it wouldn't hurt to try solving it as one of those Caesar ciphers we were talking about. You can pretty easily find programs that will uh, do all 25 of the shifts, and you can look down through and see if anything's coming out there. You could try throwing it into a cryptogram solver and see what that comes up with. And another real popular cipher uh, I found on geocaching.com is the Visionaire cipher. Um, it's one that requires a keyword, but a lot of times you can pick up on a keyword from something in the cache listing, uh, something in the title, or maybe even the cache owner's name. You know, there's, there's lots of little things you can try in terms of keywords, and using the uh, online tools to do that makes it go pretty fast. You know, if you're working with pencil and paper, you don't want to try 10 different keywords, but using the uh, online tools makes that really go pretty fast. So my recommendation would just be, you know, to start out with the, some of the lower difficulties, uh, easier ones while you, uh, you know, sort of cut your teeth on them and then work your way up to some of the more juicy ones. Yeah, the online tools and even tools on our uh, smartphones can really help with that, of course. Entering some of that data on the smartphone gets to be really a pain, so copy and paste comes in handy. Mm -hmm. But I've run into a number of them that don't seem to be uh, ciphers, so are, is there anything that you can tell us to look out for aside from the uh, ciphers or the hidden stuff in the code and that kind of thing? Absolutely. You know, I, you could go on and on and on, but I was thinking about sort of a short list. Uh, there's something called a book cipher, which isn't your traditional sort of cipher, but it relates to some sort of a text. I did some with a Harry Potter theme one time. You know, a lot of folks are going to have a copy of Harry Potter on the shelf, so it's not too hard to do a, a cipher based on a, a commonly um, known book. Uh, book uh, the Bible would be another example, you know, that a lot of people... some can use. Um, anagrams are very common, if, especially if you see a title that looks like, you know, huh, what? <laughs> uh, anagramming the title, sometimes you'll come up with something that could be useful that way. Uh, there's all kinds of great puzzles that have related to music. Uh, either you have to be able to read music and the musical notation or listen to some music and figure out um, you know what you're hearing kind of a name that tune type of thing uh, some real interesting things can be done with audio files um, and again a lot of that will require software to fool with but um, you can also see things just based on the telephone keypad that's a fairly simple type of one that, uh, that you can sometimes figure out that old style texting where we has, used to have to hit, you know, AAA to, or 111 to make us C or whatever. Uh, uh, there are some uh, mathematical types of things that are out there, you know, the digits of pi, prime numbers, the Fibonacci sequence, uh, those kinds of things. Sometimes you have to um, do a little bit of math and solve to figure out, you know, what might be going on. Uh, there are... Uh, not just math puzzles, but sort of computer-related puzzles, puzzles that use uh, ASCII code, um, which is ways of representing uh, information for computers, and that could be in a binary format using just zeros and ones. It could be in the regular format, or it could be in the hexadecimal format, which is a way of uh, using 16 digits rather than our normal 10. So those are some things to, to watch for. And again, there's all kinds of translators online that you can use it and uh, find out how to do those. Uh, I think I've seen some really creative representations of Morse code. You know, it doesn't always just have to be dots and dashes. It can be other things representing the dots and dashes. Uh, Braille is another one that's got some dots in there that you could represent very creatively. Uh, visually, and uh, binary as well is another uh, one that you could represent, those zeros and ones meaning meaning lots of, of different things. And uh, since you mentioned bacon a minute ago, uh, there is the, the bacon cipher that uh, we usually think of working with zeros and ones, and I've seen some very uh, fun puzzles that use the, the 
Bacon cipher. It's a way of sort of hiding things in there that you might not expect. So anything that talks about Bacon, that would be a good thing to, <laughs> to study up on. So <laughs> I think the bottom line is, you know, the puzzle could be about anything. So trying anything and everything, uh, Googling anything and everything, even if it seems kind of wacky, it could play out. Uh, Sometimes you uh, get ideas that are going to help you solve another puzzle or even create your own puzzle. One of my favorite puzzles that I made was one that uh, was something that I tried to do in somebody else's puzzle and it didn't work out. So those kinds of things can, can make uh, fun puzzles for other folks. And if you keep good notes, um, that can be really useful to you in terms of going back and remembering mm -hmm. what you did. That's something I'm trying to do better at because I tend to work on the back of an envelope or something and you know I can't always find what in the world I was doing. Um, so. I mailed the solution off to the phone company. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, I got Daryl thinking about uh, Caesar salad. Now I'm thinking about bacon. Um, you know, mm, I've, bacon. <laughs> I've um, done a couple of, of puzzle caches myself. I created them. And it's amazing. I'll have a puzzle cache and a non-puzzle cache, a traditional side-by-side. -side. I'll get hundreds of finds on the traditional and maybe 25 on a puzzle cache. In fact, I, the puzzle cache I had to retire, it was found so little that the tree, the knot in the tree I put it in closed up around the container <laughs> because people weren't there going after it. So, I believe it. It's, it's a little sad. Yeah. You know, puzzle caches tend to sometimes get a little bit lonely, but I sort of, my philosophy was I wanted to put out what I wanted to find, and mm -hmm. so I have put out a mm -hmm. lot of puzzle caches, and I've, I've kind of found it's gotten funny that people sort of coming around the area because they know there are a lot of puzzles here. There's some challenges where you have to find a certain number of puzzles in a day or, you know, bump up your puzzle finds and so people are actually coming around just to do the puzzles and I that's a hoot I love it when uh, puzzle cashers show up to do that because that's the way I travel I go to places I've become a regular up in Rochester New York a couple hours away from here and I just go for puzzles and I'll walk right by the traditionals it drives my friends crazy because <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's the ones I focus on so you know to each their own they're out there for everybody to find and uh, if you guys haven't seen it I highly recommend the uh, Puzzle Cache public service announcement on YouTube. It gives a very good uh, uh, case for the lonely puzzle caches that everybody should go out and uh, try to make some finds on those poor things because they are oh, very lonely. I know that one so well. You know yep. <laughs> yep. Now, a few winters ago, there was a cache published in our area, and it went a couple of weeks without being solved. So there was a group of us together and, you know, we were working through email and, and that, uh, a, uh, Google doc trying to figure this out. And it took us a little more than a week. And we were in contact with the CEO trying to get a nudge, try, you know, and eventually we went all out as a group. I, I want to say there was almost 20 of us that claimed the first to find, but, uh, you know, so, yeah, it was it was hard. It was it was a point of pride of to solve the puzzle without asking for help. But sometimes that's not always the case. I I certainly agree with that. You know, um, after you've put in some work, you really shouldn't hesitate to go ahead and ask the cash owner. Uh, I think especially if it's uh, after the first to find. You know, if it's been out for a while, uh, why not ask for help? You know, all they can do is is say no, right? You know, that's and, true. Uh, my philosophy is, you know, I want my caches to be found, and I'm willing to give anything from a little tiny nudge up to an outright spoiler. And uh, since I'm, I'm not in the business, but uh, I enjoy cultivating puzzle cachers and and help, helping people to build up their skills. I tend to ask them how much they want. You know, where what have they looked at so far? Where are they? And I'll, mm -hmm. and I'll tell them, okay, well, this is where I'm going to start you. I'll give you this little nudge, and we'll see how that works out. But if you need more, let me know, and I'll give you more. I think most people don't want you to tell them how the puzzle works. They really just want a little kick in the pants to get them moving. Um, and oftentimes that's all it takes. you know. But if they need more, I don't mind giving more. And I, I think a lot of... Uh, puzzle owners that way. We, we do respect the amount of time that it sometimes takes and you know there's a very fine line between enjoying the challenge and beating your head against the wall and the, the trick is to stay on the right side of that line and you know, sometimes I, 
I've been so glad that I asked for a hint because I never in a million years would have gotten what they were uh, trying to get. Or I was on such a completely different track, you know, going down every rabbit hole that I had explored and I just wasn't even close. So, uh, you know, there's other times too when I, I get a hint from somebody and I look at what I've got written down on the paper in front of me and I literally have the answer right in front of me. Uh, but I just didn't see it, you know. And those you do kind of kick yourself a little bit. But um, I, I really encourage people to just, you know, fess up and ask for a little help. Work together, like you say, you know, working together with people can be a lot of fun because people have different experiences, different talents. We see things in different ways. We think about things in different ways, and that can be a lot of fun to uh, work with other people and toss your ideas around. Yeah, yeah, one of my favorite rainy day activities is sitting around the coffee shop trying to solve uh, puzzle caches with fellow cashers. Mm -hmm. Now, we did actually get a, a question from the live Q&A. This comes from Wet Coaster, and he asked, uh, which verification site do you prefer? That's a good question. You know, honestly, I don't think I prefer any given one. There's pluses and minuses to all of them. I will have to say though, honestly, and I apologies to whoever created this one, but I hate events. Events is just, <laughs> it's sort of evil, you know. I, I tend to fat finger my coordinates. I'll type in things wrong sometimes and the thing, it makes you wait 10 minutes even if you just, you know, I'm not trying to brute force the thing. I just type something wrong and that one I really don't like <laughs> but uh, just geo checker is, is totally fine. Uh, GeoCheck I like because it gives you the opportunity to add in hints or uh, photographs, you know, all kinds of extra information can be in there. And Certitude is, is kind of a fun one just because it's got the capability to have uh, hints added in as well as that idea of, of using a keyword with it. So I think they're all, you know, roughly equivalent in terms of how you use them. Um, some people don't like the certitude, how it lists the names of who, you know, solve things uh, first. You don't have to put your name in there. You can be anonymous and, you know, there, there's nothing that says you have to put your name in unless you're in, into that uh, first to solve uh, mentality, uh, which some of us have been known to do. <laughs> uh, and the geochecker is another one that, uh, let's see, geocheck.org with the red and green squares on the cache base. That's kind of nice because it gives you an idea how many people are getting it right and how many people are getting it wrong, uh, just like Certitude does. So I think there's pluses and minuses to all of them. Uh, but having one is, is so much better, any one of them, than not having any at all. So. Yeah, he, uh, White Coaster does agree that uh, events is evil <laughs> and annoying. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> uh. Nice. So those those cord checkers are really nice. But if I think I've got the right coordinates, I'll drop it into you know uh, Google Maps just to see. Yeah, look at that. It's not inside the mall. I did okay. But exactly. Uh, you know, and I think there's a there's a general sort of a guideline that your puzzle caches are usually going to be within two miles of the posted coordinates. It's not a hard and fast rule. And certainly mm -hmm. the um, farther back you go in time, your older puzzles are less likely to follow that. Uh, but even today with the, how much uh, geo art there is that's out there, you know, the um, caches don't always end up being within that two mile radius, but that yeah. usually they are. So it's, it's a good, you know, if your answer turns out to be six miles away and it's a brand new puzzle, uh, probably not going to be the right answer. So, Well, my favorite uh, type of puzzle is a double rot 13. I think that's that's one of the ones that I really go to. And if you didn't catch that, just think about it. You'll get it. Um, but I understand you've put some links together to help cashers with puzzles. I have. Uh, I actually gave a presentation at a geocaching event a couple months ago where I created this uh, link. It's a, I'm not sure how you can give the link, but I'll, I'll read it for folks. It's a tinyurl.com and then slash capital U4 puzzle links, all one word. And in there I have some um, links to get started, some sort of general background information about uh, geocaching puzzles, uh, very sort of basic things. I have some links to training puzzle caches. There are lots and lots of really creative um, puzzles that were created for the specific purpose of teaching people how to puzzle cache. Uh, 
probably the granddaddy of all of these is the uh, Puzzle Solving 101 series, which is down in Florida. And uh, I actually had the opportunity to go down and, and make the finds on those and meet with uh, E. Peterson too and uh, have lunch with them. And uh, that was a, a really awesome uh, cashcation that we took down that way. Uh, but that's just one of them. There are other sort of training puzzles out there as well that you can do. I have some links to some very useful online tools, including some of those cipher solving sites I was talking about, some of the math uh, things I was talking about can be found on there. Uh, I have a link to the geocaching puzzle of the day. Uh, I'd love it for folks to check that out. I, I tend to put the easier puzzles on the weekends. I, I found right away that not as many people were looking at them on the weekend. I think that's those folks that are looking at it at work. <laughs> so we have uh, easy puzzles on the weekend. And throughout the week they vary, but I do tend to put the harder ones on Friday. So if you wake up tomorrow and look at it and see a hard one, don't. You know, don't be scared off. The, the Friday ones are generally kind of, kind of tough. But uh, and then the last thing I have on there is some advice about making your own puzzle caches. You know, selfishly, I suppose I'm trying to encourage people to put out more puzzles so that I can go find more puzzle caches. And uh, if you uh, put just a little bit of effort into uh, the design of your puzzle and thinking about how it works and maybe having someone test it for you, I think the whole solving experience uh, is better for everybody all the way around. So all those links are out there for everybody to use. Well, I certainly agree with that. So thank you so much, Jennifer. This has been helpful. In fact, you know, while we're talking, I had some puzzle cache ideas, so I might <laughs> just have to make one of my own again to see if I can get 25 people to go find it. Very good. <laughs> Now, earlier in the show, we thanked our patrons, and we want to do this again because your support is very important to us. It not only keeps the servers spinning and the postal carriers running, but your don donations also help us to motiv or help motivate us to keep working on the great content for these shows. Now, if you'd like to become one of these uh, don donors, uh, help support the show, you get some cool extras, click on the link on the website or show notes. You can head on over to patreon.com slash geogearheads. You can check that out and pledge a couple dollars each month. Once again, thank you for all our patrons for your continuing support. Now, you mentioned the uh, Postal Carrier's Bad Cop, and uh, that's also thanks to some of the great companies like GX Proxy who donate prizes for you, the audience, to win. Get that email ready, and it's almost time for question 124. If you're one of the correct answers received at geogearheads at cachemaniacs.com with the subject question 124 and your geocaching.com screen name, you could win another pri prize pack from GX Proxy. This time, we want to know how many caches worldwide were published at the launch of geocaching.com on September 2nd, 2000. Include your answer with your geocaching.com screen name in the email titled question 124 by 9 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on May 14th to be included in that drawing. Now you want to mark your calendars for uh, in order to watch next week's show live as it's our randomized show and we're going to be giving away a special gift to one of the live viewers during that show. So pull out your phone right now Put that on the calendar app because you're not going to want to miss it. You can watch either through Google Plus or YouTube at 6.10 p.m. Pacific. That's 9.10 p.m. Eastern. And watch Twitter and Facebook as we post with uh, a special page for the Cash Maniac site where you can go watch the show. We have a bunch of great shows coming up. Uh, it's not including next week's randomized show. That's Randomize 23. We've done 22 of these. This is 23 with Walt Grogan. He's joining us to talk about a bunch of subjects, most of which are from you, our audience. Now, on May 22nd, we're going to talk with uh, Open Caching North America. May 29th, we're talking about Glimpse. June 5th, we're talking about more new news from Munzee. New news? All news is new, right? It's news. Uh, June 12th, our events. So if you have anything to share, whether that's comments, tips, tricks, corrections, updates, or just any other feedback you'd like to share, call our voicemail line at 206-350-3647, or you can email us, geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com. If you're watching through the Google Plus 
through the Googles. If you're watching through the Google Plus, you can also drop questions, just as Wet Coaster did this evening, and comments uh, through the live Q and A. That's especially fun during the randomized shows. Check the Cashamaniacs website at cashamaniacs.com for more on the Geo Gearheads, including show notes for this and all of our episodes. We love hearing from our listeners, so leave us feedback by calling 206 350 3647 by emailing geogearheads at cashamaniacs.com or through social media. Your support helps keep the Cashamaniac shows coming. Please com- Please consider becoming a patron or making a PayPal donation through the link on our website to support the Cashamaniac shows. Geo Gearheads is produced by Chris Offenauer and Daryl Wattenberg. This show is copyright 2014 by Daryl Wattenberg, all race reserved.